Picture this. It's 2021. You're 11 years old. You still go to school online. You've been robbed of one of the most important years of your social development. Trapped in your room, writing Raylo fanfiction and building seven-story mansions in Minecraft. You've taken up puppetry because baking didn't work out. You're getting really into new wave French cinema. You don't know it yet, but you're definitely at least bisexual. You are desperate for something to reach out and tell you that you are seen. That this festering weirdness is going to take you somewhere, anywhere. Don't worry, darling. Katie Mitchell sees you. And she wants you to know that she had it way worse. The Mitchells vs. The Machines is a 2020 Sony Pictures film delayed into 2021 and then sold to Netflix for immediate streaming distribution because COVID. It was produced by Phil Lord and Chris Miller of Lego Movie and Spider-Verse fame and co-written and directed by Gravity Falls alumni Mike Rionda and Jeff Rowe, the latter of whom would go on to co-write and direct Mutant Mayhem. This to say, there was a lot of talent and hype behind the movie briefly known as Connected, which is thematically a better title, but admittedly more blandly corporate. The film follows aggressively quirky art kid Katie Mitchell, recently accepted to a film school in California that is definitely not CalArt specifically, and her insane dysfunctional family that drags her on a cross-country road trip to get her there, immediately interrupted by what else but the AI revolution. The Mitchells vs. the Machines was supposed to be Sony's immediate follow-up to Spider-Verse, cementing themselves as a burgeoning titan of the industry in the renaissance of heavily stylized animation. Its delay and fanfareless Netflix release definitely hindered its greater impact on the animation space, but on a technical level, The Mitchells vs. the Machines doesn't just accomplish its goal, but embodies it. It's a movie made by art kids for art kids, about being an art kid, with a side of animal style art kid fries. Also, there's robots in it. Every year, when the Oscars roll around without fail, there are anywhere from two to five acceptance speeches that espouse some variation of art can save the world. And while as a beaten and broken grunt of the greater Hollywood machine, my instinct is to spit on the ground when I hear that, it's kind of hard to deny Katie Mitchell literally saves the world using the power of weird art kid energy, because she's a fucking chad. Katie is 18 and knows how to use Adobe Creative Cloud. She's not a chosen one. She's not ex-military or a hacker or even, like, good at a sport that's weirdly useful during the apocalypse. She has one singular skill, and that's being clever, which is the best skill. She thinks quickly, she's good at talking, and she's creative, which in many increasingly relevant ways makes her the perfect enemy of AI. From the moment the robots show up, almost every functional plan is Katie's idea, and all of them are on-the-fly, outside-the-box solutions, often pulled directly from movie cliches. The road camo and the dog shield are especially charming because they are thoroughly inventive exploitations of AI's notorious blind spots, something you'd truly believe only Katie could come up with out of everyone in the family. This doesn't just matter because it is itself clever, but because it makes artistic ingenuity into a practical skill with heroic merit. Katie's love and knowledge of stories directly leads to solutions, from something as complex and meta as understanding the pre-dystopian science fiction hubris of tech bros, to something as primally human as ripping a good motivational speech off the top of your head. When Rick Mitchell brought a live, non-neutered, feral possum into our home, did he play it safe? I see what you're doing. When we went hiking, and halfway up the mountain, it said trail closed. Did we play it safe then? Was it over when the Germans bombed Pearl Harbor? Hell no! German? Forget it, he's rolling. Usually, young protagonists are forced into the role of hero for a logistical reason. Nobody believes them. All the adults are suddenly gone for some reason. They're a chosen one or have a supernatural ability that makes them uniquely suited to the issue at hand. 
While it's technically true that everyone else in the world was kidnapped, the Mitchells in general avoid capture because they're too chaotic for robots to outmaneuver. And Katie in specific is the hero because she's proactive, and because she's insightful enough to apply her skill set to the apocalypse, not the other way around. She's John McClane with a can of spray paint and a pocketbook of dope one-liners. It's more important than it looks to show kids just how far that can take you. I've talked a few times before about how the role of media for older kids is less about educating and extolling everyday virtues, and more about reaching out and making its audience feel seen and understood. It's not a hard line, but it's a noticeable shift towards self-actualization as a driving narrative force. Katie is armed with nothing but a shitty old sedan and cartoon mise-en-scene, and yet time after time she outwits an army of faceless automatons who literally want to put her in a box. That is not an accident. Time after time, she proves that clever is a skill. Which is why it's such a great plot beat that her last plan just isn't enough. My dad wanted to be a fighter pilot. Shut the fuck up, this is going somewhere. He almost went to the Naval Academy. But until 1990, you had to have perfect vision to go to flight school. That was it. No LASIK, no sports goggles. So long, good luck, hope you find a new dream. He used to remind me about it all the time when I was a terrible student with no interest in taking a second major in international studies or whatever stupid thing I did for half a semester of my freshman year. He still reminds me about it all the time, like seven years later, but it's not the same way. The message isn't dreams exist to be crushed, so you better have a backup plan. It's, you still have a dream, and it's right there, so try not to panic. That's not an easy step to make for someone who could have rather justifiably sat down and been bitter for decades. And that's why I goddamn love Rick Mitchell. Rick Mitchell is a dad's dad's dad. He sits atop a golden recliner, with a medium rare porterhouse in one hand, and a car part you've never seen before in the other. His introduction leans hard on his sheer dadness, because alienating his perspective by playing into the generational gap actually helps harshen the blow of what is, by all accounts, not the worst advice. That's right, big payoff. I think Rick has a pretty good point here in the inciting incident. And I think Jeff Rowe and Mike Rionda probably think that too, which is why they bury it under the rubble of Rick's broken dreams, dropping some of the most infamous lines in the art kid lexicon. I just wonder, do you really think you can make a living with this stuff? I just worry that you're gonna be all the way in California and you know, we're not gonna be able to help you, you know, if things don't don't pan out. Do you just think I'm gonna fail? Oh, failure hurts, kid. I want you to have a backup plan. Why do you always have to do this? This conversation is such a clever, inciting incident because, in retrospect, we know Rick is projecting onto Katie over life decisions he's still contending with. And even in the moment, it's clear his doubts come from a place of love and concern for his daughter. But the writers cheated. They used the forbidden tongues, the secret phrases that turn all art kids into insecure, defensive hobgoblins like a pink-haired Manchurian candidate. This is how the thematic conflict is put on a very realistic emotional roller coaster immediately, and how the Mitchells vs. the Machines buys itself the time to be, I would go so far as to say, barely about an AI apocalypse. I mean, it's cute, the generational gap stuff. It makes sense that Rick's weakness is Google Chrome. It maximizes the different skill sets he and Katie bring to the table. But really, this could have been any world-ending problem. The central conflict of the Mitchells vs. the Machines is the universal art kid experience of proving yourself, proving in most cases to your likely skeptical parents that your path is a valid one. And the irony that in this case, as a failed, or it's probably better to say lost artist in his own right, Rick is effectively trying to do the same. Beat after beat, plan after plan, Katie and Rick play this game of philosophical cat and mouse, each thinking they're doing a great job making superficial concessions while secretly proving their point to the other, until they finally meet in the middle. 
Rick is hesitant not simply because he wants to see his family safe, which he clearly does, but you don't really wait out the apocalypse. Rick's problem is a projected fear of failure. To try is to be open to failure. To be open to growth is to invite the proof that you are as of yet useless. He doesn't outright want Katie to adopt his fear, nor does he want her to fail. He just wants to be needed, and as such, needs to restrain Katie's flair. Meanwhile, on the opposite side of the spectrum, Katie is in her nobody-understands-me era, so vehemently locked into the become-artist-or-die mentality that by her own admission, the AI revolution is but an obstacle standing between her and her imagined future, where she makes art friends and does movies for a living. On the one hand, it can be read as aspirational for young, impressionable art kids who want proof for themselves that their interests matter and their skills are valuable. On the other hand, it's reckless to live on raw charisma and ingenuity, because as it turns out, failure fucking hurts, and it lurks in the shadows, hungrily waiting for everyone, especially you. So let's revisit the climax of the story now. Katie's last plan is working. The dog shield is up, the car is magnetically locked to the track, she's on her way toward Pal. The growth here has already happened. Katie and Rick have both had changes of heart. They're using each other's knowledge to work outside their comfort zones and save the day. But plain and simple, it's not enough. Obviously, this is mostly to ratchet up the tension for the last second save, but it happens because it can always happen. The Mitchells are still fighting alone, and something this huge requires a united front. It's a metaphor for how creatives are helpless children without techs, and techs are overpaid movers without creatives. It's also, and much more importantly, a straightforward espousing of the importance of family ties. The Mitchells vs. the Machines is, at face value, a story about the many ways in which creativity is a more practical skill than it's given credit for, and how, if nurtured, it can prove to be an invaluable asset that no amount of seemingly perfect preparation can outweigh. That's a good thing to teach kids, and it makes for a unique and enjoyable movie. But that's almost ancillary. The Mitchells vs. the Machines is, at its core, a story about how creativity is a treasured virtue and a basic human need, a universal experience across lifestyles and skill sets, and a bridge by which any distance between people can be ungapped. Rick Mitchell is a man plagued by regret, who fears change not because of its inherent uncertainty, but because his experience with it, the rigid perspective he has of it as something lost. Being forced to change for Katie reminds him that in losing his art, he gained his family, and that everything lost means something gained. This to say, to prove what he really wanted to know, that Katie will be fine. If he's still growing now, her potential is limitless. Speaking of, Katie Mitchell is a girl who truly believes she can take on the world by herself. That confidence is awesome, but if you take it with you, completely unchecked, to the mean streets of Burbank, California, you will be crushed like an insect. Through Rick, she learns the value of differing perspectives, the whole being greater than the sum of the parts, and the need to remember where you came from to hold on to who you are. Failure is not a boogeyman. It's out there waiting for all of us. It's cold and impassive. And in the entertainment industry, especially since March of 2020, it has been an ever-expanding black hole that eats dreams and spits out freelance copywriters. But failure, as real as it is, is a matter of perspective. Dreams don't always come true, but life is much too long to shoot an arrow at a target 30 years away. If Katie Mitchell were a real person, she would be graduating from CalArts right about now. 
She'd have refined her craft, made lifelong friends, vital connections in the varying fields of the filmmaking world. She'd have practiced and gauged her own interest in the industry branches of, you know, VFX, practical effects, 2D and 3D animation, puppetry and production design, pre- and post-production development, talent development, color and editing and sound, and she'd have loved some and hated others. But she would have a real place to start, and no real clue where it would end. That's the beauty of it, in a way. Somebody's gotta do everything, and no matter how deep into itself this godforsaken industry crunches, it will not die. The real Katie Mitchells, the bright-eyed, bushy-tailed little weirdos I see starting to creep into networking mixers, asking the same stupid, cocky questions I asked in 2020, they're gonna be alright. Because they know we don't all get to be writers, directors, actors, producers, certainly not right away, and maybe not ever. They're ready to fail. Because in this world, when a door hits you in the ass on the way out, it tends to knock you right through another door. All of these doors are for you, Katie, as much as they are for any of us. Appreciate what you have, and remember that somewhere out there, Someone who's not as tough as you has already given up. The show will go on, and you will be part of it.